It certainly is a blessing to be able to share with you this morning and to say praise God for all that he's been doing, for his goodness, for his love, and for his mercy. God is certainly good to us, not because we deserve his goodness, but because he's a good God and his goodness he showed to us. It's a privilege to be able to share his word in this fashion. We realize that we are in uh, strange times, uh, times unprecedented, times that we have not experienced in our lifetime up to this point. There are many in the world throughout history who have experienced a lot worse than we are experiencing now. Uh, to be honest about it, even though we are living in a pandemic, life still is pretty good. We are restricted in, to a certain extent, but we still have a certain amount of freedoms. We still are able to um, enjoy many of the things in life. I understand that many can't enjoy all the things that they would like to enjoy. But such is life in a place where things have always been good and any sort of disruption is uh, unbearable to many. But maybe it's a good time for us to learn that uh, every day something new may happen. And it's good training for us to know how we are going to adjust when changes occur. So in spite of anything, uh, uh, everything that's happening, I am still grateful to God. I am not disappointed. I know I would love to see us gathering together again, but instead of moping and complaining, I'm going to say, thank you, Lord. We are still able to meet in this fashion. We are still alive and, and relatively healthy. Even though this pandemic is raging, still the vast, overwhelming, vast majority of the population has not uh, contracted the virus. We sympathize with those who have, and we pray for them, and we pray for their healing. So we praise God in everything. Scripture says in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We don't know exactly what the Lord is doing, so we want to remain humble. We want to remain open to him and say, Lord, speak to my heart. May I hear you, what you're speaking. So this morning, we want to rejoice in the Lord. And I say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your peace, for your mercy. So this morning, I would like to share with you uh, a topic that I called, Thy Word is Truth, or Your Word is Truth. And I want to share, with that, uh, share that with you from the Gospel of St. John. And I will be touching on different scriptures. I call it a sort of quick survey or a brief survey of selected verses from John 13 chapter right through to John 17. Obviously, uh, I'm not intending on going through all of each chapter because um, you would be looking at many, many hours of that. So I'm just going to draw from selected verses from each of those chapters and sprinkling in there too, a uh, few references to other scriptures that I think will help us understand um, the thought I'm trying to bring to you this morning. But before we begin, I'd like to pray and ask the Lord to be with us. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, your son, who came to this earth 2000 years ago and gave his life a ransom for us, we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. And because of that this morning, Lord, we praise you and we have salvation and we have hope and we have the peace of God that passes all, under, all understanding. And so, Lord, I thank you for gathering this morning and we pray for your anointing. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would lead us this morning by your spirit. Lord, I pray that you will use me as a vessel Lord, to share your word with your people. This is your word, Lord, and I take it seriously, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord, to do justice to your word. 
to be honest with your word. God, to be truthful, Lord. I desire, Lord, that truth, O oh God, be in inward parts, because that's what you desire. Father, my desire, my intention, O oh Lord, is to share your word to the best of my understanding, my knowledge, and as you, through your spirit, would guide me. I pray, Lord, for your people this morning who are listening to us, Lord, those of our congregation and those of our friends who have joined. Father, I pray that you let your word through your spirit minister to their hearts. Oh Lord, maybe answer some questions. God, maybe clear up some confusion. Oh Lord, maybe open some eyes. But Lord, all of this is to your glory. We do this, Lord Jesus, in your honor, and we dedicate the rest of this service to your hand and ask your Holy Spirit to be our guide and our leader. By God, we praise you and thank you for your anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so let's begin. The, the foundational verse that I want to use in this is John 17, 17. And I will refer to it later on. It says, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth, or your word is truth. To sanctify means to set apart. So the Lord was saying, asking his father to sanctify his believers, his disciples, in their truth. And I will talk somewhere about that later on as we go on. But the context of this that I'm sharing here are from John 17, chapter 13, chapter to 17, chapter, is Jesus, as he was getting close to the time when his ministry on this earth would come to an end. And as he was nearing the end of his earthly ministry, he began to prepare his disciples for life on earth without his physical presence. We know that his ministry covered about three years on earth and the disciples were with him and now he was getting ready to leave. And can you imagine, you know, when we have somebody visiting us for a while that we're dear to and we have developed good relationship with. When it's time for them to leave, it, it's usually a sad time. Sometimes there are tears shed, lots of hugging, or God, um, because we don't know when we'll see that person again. And the, the friendship and the fellowship and the good times that we've had over the time of that visit is coming to an end. We have all been through that. So here's Jesus. The disciples have developed a good relationship with their, their Savior, with their Master. He had lifted their hopes. He had taught them a whole lot of things. They had seen miracles that he had performed. And now he was leaving. If you read the scriptures closely, you will see that they were very sad when he was leaving. And he was preparing them as a loving savior, as a loving master. He understood how they felt. Because not only was he the son of God, but he, he was also the son of man. And the scripture said, that he was tempted in all things like all of us were. So he understood what loneliness meant. He really did understand what loneliness meant. And as you read, in, in the, as he goes through the Passion, and as he was approaching his crucifixion, you'll notice how many times, at one point he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So it is very clear that Jesus understood loneliness and he understood what they were going through. So he was trying to prepare them for the task that was ahead. But it wasn't only that they were going to be without him, but the task ahead was going to be daunting. It was going to be great. And they were living in a, in a world that was not very friendly to Jesus and therefore would not be friendly to the disciples. And so the disciples may not have grasped the full uh, context of what Jesus was saying, but Jesus, knowing all things, knew that they were going to face hard times, so he was intending to prepare them for it. It's almost like no preparation could really make them ready for what they're going to face, because they had no idea how hard this was going to be. But Jesus did. So he was about to leave, so he's giving them instructions. So we'll pick up the instructions from the 13th chapter. 
And I will just, just a few points there. I am not intending to, to exhaust the whole chapter. I'm just picking a few points there. So in the 13th chapter, he had the Last Supper with them. And then if you remember, as you're reading John 30, it says he rises from supper. He laid aside his garment, his outer garment. He took a towel and he girded himself with it. I am just recalling my, my memory of the scripture here. And he girded himself, he poured water into a container and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And after he did that, we know all the uh, the, the rest of stuff that went on, or Peter resisted for a while because, again, he didn't understand. But after Jesus explained to him briefly, he was ready for a bath, not just have his feet washed. Okay, so after he had uh, washed their feet, he sat down, the scripture said, and he said, Do you know what I have done? You call me Lord, and you call me Master, and that's right, because I am your Lord and Master. And then he says, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And I'm not intending to go through the old implications of that, but just to say, Jesus was modeling servant leadership principle. That is, it was almost like a reversal because servants wash their master's feet. And especially in those days, it was an act that was usually done, especially when you're traveling on a dusty road, you come into a house and your feet were, were, were washed, but, uh, and there was water prepared. So that was a part of, uh, of custom. But Jesus, but it was not the master that washed the servant's feet. It was the servants who washed the master's feet. But here is Jesus, the master, washing his servant's feet. He was showing how we are to live among each other. He was a, uh, expressing to them the idea that we are to be humble with each other, that we are to submit ourselves to each other, which is a theme in scripture as well. So the master was playing the role of a servant, which is a big rebuke to us today in the way that even some of God's people behave. Uh, as if we are looking for, for people to serve us rather than us looking to serve others because that's what Jesus did. <clears throat> Even though he had every right to expect them to serve him at every turn, he had every right to do that, but he humbled himself. If the Son of God could humble himself to become like a servant, then we see we are, we are lacking if we refuse to do the same. So that was what I am taking from John 13. Then in John chapter 14, because the whole section of chapters was is our instruction to them, preparing them. So in John 14, he comforts his disciples because they were, they were troubled. And he said to them, let not your heart be troubled. That's in the first verse of John 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we know he goes on to say that in his father's house are many mansions or many, or many rooms, and that he will be going to prepare for them a place and that he would re return again. But he's comforting them so that when he's gone, they would have a comforter. He was there as a comforter but now he would be taken away from him. And because he said that, they were sad. And he even referred to that and said, you are sad because I said, I am leaving. But he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And of course, that was in the form of the spirit. He promised to send them another comforter or helper. That's what the word means. A helper that would guide them, that would give them strength that helper would be with them. And he said to them, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. This would not be an ordinary helper. This is a powerful helper. This is a helper that would always be with them. This is a helper that knows 
everything. A helper that would go before them. A helper that would empower them. And as we read the history of the apostles, as they began their ministry, if we read it in the book of Acts, it was that helper, the Holy Spirit, that was with them. We know that uh, on the day of Pentecost, when, when the Holy Spirit came to them and uh, endued them with power from, from, from above, as the scripture says, they were like changed men. These men who had uh, a few weeks or months earlier had all forsook Jesus and fled, suddenly they became brave that even the authorities who saw them realized that there was something different about these men. And that was because they were empowered by this helper that Jesus promised to pray the Father. He went to his Father, and true to his promise, he sent the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1 and 8, we know that he told them that they had to go to Jerusalem and wait until the power came. They did. They obeyed, and the power came. He's always true to his promise. We have that same assurance today that whatever he promises us, we are going to receive it. He's a keeper of promises. This comforter, this helper would be the spirit of truth. And that's in, in chapter um, 14 and 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. Believers of a personal relationship with Christ. They know Christ. We know Christ. The world or unbelievers do not have a personal relationship with Christ. So the world does not know the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to them, the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him. It does not perceive him. It does not understand him. It does not understand his ministry, nor it doesn't know him. When we talk about know here, we're talking about having a close, intimate relationship with someone. We have a close, intimate relationship with Jesus. He sends his spirit to indwell us. So we have that intimate relationship with him. We know him. The world does not know him. And, and, and that's why the scripture can say, as we read in Romans, that the, the, the carnal mind is enmity to God. And that there's always a struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Because this flesh does not comprehend the spirit. And the world is flesh. So the world cannot comprehend the spirit, but the believers can. So that's why when the spirit came, he would be coming to those who know Christ. Believers have already accepted Christ as their savior. They already have a, a relationship with him. So therefore, if we have a relationship with, with the son, we are going to have a relationship with the father and we're going to have a relationship with the spirit. And that's what we are told in the scripture. In chapter 15, Jesus stressed the importance of them remaining attached to the true vine, which is himself. In order to be fruitful, he said that we must abide and remain in him. From verse 1 to 5 in chapter 15, he said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. In the old New King James, in the old, sorry, King James, it says, the husband man. Then he goes on to say, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And please take note of that verse. It's verse 3 says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. What God is giving us there is right there an indication 
that what does the cleansing is the word of God. And Jesus is saying, you are already clean. If we receive him, receive his word, the cleansing is already happening in our lives. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, the, the truth of the matter here, all of us are on, um, have an understanding of what it is for a branch to be attached to a, a tree or to a, a vine. Uh, some of the activities of the people in those days were what we call agrarian. It was very much an agrarian society where farming and in that part of the world, raising things like grapes, what was a, a popular um, activity for people to, um, to make their living on. So they understood what, what he meant by saying that in the vineyard, the vines have to be attached to, the, uh, the branches have to be attached to the vine for that branch to be able to bear any fruit. But not only the attachment, but they also have to give attendance to those branches, if they were fruitless, they're dead, they have to cut them away. Some pruning has to go on. You have to clean. There has to be some cleansing that, that goes on there. And even today, when people are in, in those activities, there's a certain amount of cultivating that has to happen for that vineyard to be fruitful. Now, Jesus is saying that if we are going to be able to be effective, to do effective ministry, for him, we can't do it on our own. This, uh, when I read this, uh, an idea comes to my mind about what we call freelancing, where we can't just take off on our own and say, you know, I don't need anybody. I just know what I'm doing and I'm on my own. It's like a phrase that many people said, me and Jesus have our own thing going and we don't care what anybody else has to say. But Jesus is saying, we must be attached to him. Unless we attach to him, we are fruitless. The substance that the branch needs comes from the vine. The branch of any tree, if it's broken off, it dries up, it dies. The food that the branch needs comes through the vine. Jesus is the vine. But not only is the vine that through whom the substance flow, but he said his father is the vine dresser. That means the, fa the father will tend to this vineyard. And when there are branches that are unfruitful, the father will cut them away. They will be thrown away. The one purpose of the branch is to bear fruit. I was reading a little bit on this this, this past week and he said a branch it's not good for building house. It's not good for making furniture. It's not even good fuel. You put it in the fire and it just consumes just right away. There's no sustaining of heat from the branch. There's one purpose for the branch and the branch is to bear fruit. Therefore, if that branch is going to fulfill its purpose, it has to remain attached to the vine. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How many times we say that? We even sing a song and say, Lord, it's not about me, it's all about you. Detached from the vine, the branch is useless. We must remain. In chapter 16, Jesus says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, 
he will speak and he will tell you things to come. The truth is God's word, which is the Bible. That's where the truth is written. That's where you'll find the truth. And the spirit will guide his people into the truth and it will glorify or exalt Christ. It will not glorify man, it will glorify Christ. But the point here that's being made that the spirit that God sent his disciples is the spirit of truth. And I, I don't have to remind anyone that in the times that we are living in today, truth is at a premium. Many times people today are frustrated, they're flabbergasted, they're confused. People will throw their hands up in, in the air now in frustration and they say, who is telling the truth? What is the truth? Because there's so many things happening and so many people saying so many things and everybody's claiming that they are speaking the truth. And yet everything is so conflicting, so contradictory. I, I, I recall many years ago, there was someone that used to um, visit our church and th this person was quite faithful in visiting, but they would just come and sit and observe week after week after week, but we really never did participate uh, it's almost like a, uh, an observer. And you know, you, you would talk to the person and you will try to encourage them to, to be involved. And I remember clearly that person saying, no, oh no, I'm just looking for the truth. In other words, uh, she was saying, uh, I'm searching for the truth and when I find the truth, then I'll get involved. But when I heard that, a thought came to my mind and it's always, been a question in my mind. When someone is looking for the truth, how do you know when you find it? What is the measuring stick that you are going to use to say this is the truth? Because I always say, well, how will you know when you find the truth? Because if you can recognize it when you find it, that means you already know what the truth is. You already know what you're looking for. So my point here is that if we want to find the truth, it's already there. It's in the Word of God. It's in the Bible. That's where the truth can be found. It has never changed, and it will never change. So Jesus is telling his disciples, this truth or this spirit that is coming is going to be the spirit of truth. And he will go to guide his people into the truth. Remember now that the world does not have the spirit. So the world does not have this truth. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us who know Christ to speak the truth to the world. People often talk to them about speaking truth into the situation. It is the responsibility of the believer, those who follow Christ today, to speak truth into the confusion that is happening around us today. There has to be something that people can, as a, uh, you might say, hang their hats on, something that they know is truthful, that in spite of the confusion, and in spite of all the different noises that they're hearing, that they can make a distinction and say, I can hold on to this. And Jesus knew that this was going to happen. And that's why when he was praying for his disciples, he said, I will send your comforter. I will send your helper. Because he knew that they were going to need something beyond themselves that was going to guide them in the truth, that was going to give them courage, that was going to empower them to face this world of confusion. He know that there was trouble ahead. He was preparing that. And today, the trouble is no less. We still face the same challenge, but guess what? The message hasn't changed. It is still the same spirit 
that he has given to us that we need to follow. In chapter 17, he says, he's going to pray for his disciples. And here we have the Lord's Prayer. I know many times when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, we talk about what we find in Matthew 6, where we, say, we, we repeat often about the Lord's Prayer, and we say it in school, and we repeat it. The disciples had come to Jesus, and they said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, you will say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be, or holy be your name. That was Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17, where he prays, where he wasn't teaching how to pray. He was praying because he was facing some things that were coming. He was on his way to the cross, and it was a very heavy weight he was carrying. We, we know that as he, as he prayed, as he continued later on, we, we, we can read that in the gospel, how he prayed until his sweat became drops of blood because of the distress of what he was going through. He needed to pray because he needed his father's guide and his father's strength. So he was actually praying for his disciples. So instead of teaching them how to pray, he was praying for them here. And in his prayer, he said, glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. And that the believers, continue to say, may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You would find that in verse 3 of chapter 17. So here is Jesus approaching his father. He said, Father, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you, and that the world may know you, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and that I am your son. So this is an intimate prayer between the father and the son. He prayed for his disciples in this prayer who had walked with him for the past three years. He also prayed for future believers like you and me. He said, I do not pray for these alone, that's the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through your word. I, I take great assurance today to know that here I am in the 21st century that Jesus Christ prayed for me 2,000 years ago and he prayed for you 2,000 years ago. He saw what we were going to face and he said, Father, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in you that they also may be one in us. He cared about us, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, what, what a prayer for Jesus to pray. He's asking the Father, to keep his people, those whom the Father has given to them. In fact, in one part of his prayer, he said, I have kept those whom you have given me, and the only one that is lost is the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And we know that is referring to Judas who betrayed him. But he's praying and he's saying, Father, that the world may see. Oh, folks, uh, today, there is even confusion in the Christian world today, in the world of believers, because there is so much conflicting voices happening. And we wonder, what is the world seeing when the world hears Christians getting at each other? And I don't think we can just 
I pass it off. As you know, we have different opinions and people are always going to be arguing. Oh yes, we may have different opinions, but when it comes to the basics of the word of God and what we need to be doing, then there should be a oneness. And that's why Jesus is praying that Father, that the world may know that you sent me. So he's praying also that we may be one as he's one with the Father, that they may be one in us. What an inclusion is given there to consider that the Son of God is praying that you and I would be one with the Father and with the Son. Our message is the word of God, which, which is the truth. And the unity of believers ought to be a reflection of our oneness in Christ. The world need to see that oneness in Christ, that we're believing what the word of God says. Oh, there, there is so much taking of sides in the world today. So many Christians uh, seem to be going against each other, fighting for down here, rather than looking to the word of God and speaking truth into the confusion that is happening today. And that is why uh, the, the, the topic is saying, Jesus is praying, sanctify them to thy truth. Thy word is truth. If it's one thing the world should see and should understand and recognize is that amidst the confusion that is happening, that the body of Christ is holding to the truth and with one voice is pointing people in the direction, not taking sides, not following a philosophy of the right, a philosophy of the, of the left, not a philosophy of the center, we hear all these phrases about right of center, left of center, far left, far right. What the believer needs to be doing is preaching the truth of God to every side. God is not political. God is righteous. God is holy. God is not on your side, nor on my side. The scripture didn't say whose side is God on. It says who is on the Lord's side. That's the call and that's the challenge that were made to God's people. Who is on the Lord's side? If God be God, serve him. That's what Elijah said when he confronted the prophets of Baal. If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, then serve Baal. But today he said, choose, Joshua called his people, said, choose in today whom you will serve. And then he goes on to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And folks, that's what the believers ought to be saying, that I will serve the Lord. I will speak truth into this situation, no matter what it is. So our message is the truth. And the unity of believers ought to be a reflection. The unity of our message, of our call, should be the same. It's oneness in Christ. This reminds me of the verse of an old hymn. It's called Onward Christian Soldiers. It says, one verse says, Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. Folks, this road has been paved with the blood of people over the centuries. We should not take it lightly. We are not divided, the song goes on to say. All one body, we. One in hope and doctrine, one in charity. That's a challenge to us and a reminder to us we seem to have gotten away from that and become factions or groups or cliques. And yet we, we are told we are all one body. You can find that recorded in the book of Ephesians where Paul talks about the one body. Hope is our confidence in God that he will complete what he has begun. 
When it says one in hope, we have a hope in God that he will complete what he has promised and what he has started. When it says one in doctrine, our doctrine is the word of God. Our doctrine is not some political philosophy somewhere. Our doctrine is the word of God, and that's what we need to be pushing. So we need to get back. There's a program that's called Back to the Bible. We need to get literally back to the Bible. And then it, the last part of that verse says one in charity. So we have hope, which is our confidence in God. One doctrine, which is the word of God. And, and by the way, I know that some people don't like the word doctrine. Because when, whenever we talk about doctrine, we're talking about some little things that some group believes over here and said, you have to be like us. I'm not talking about that. Jesus said, my doctrine is the word of God. So our doctrine is the word of God. The word doctrine simply means teachings. Our teaching that we follow is the word of God. The last phrase in, in that song says, one in charity. And we can clearly recall what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, we may speak with the, the tongue of men and angels, but unless we have charity, love, we are like a sounding brass or a gun, or like a clanging cymbal. Without love, without love, Paul says, we are nothing. And I confess to you today, brethren, that some of what we're hearing, and to be honest with you, my concern is not with what the world is saying. My concern is not with the vitriol that the world is spewing out. But my greatest concern is what we are hearing from people that name the name of Christ. Those are the ones that Paul is saying that without love, we are like sounding brass and tinkling symbols. What he's saying, noise makers without substance. I grew up in, in Jamaica and we used to hear this phrase that says, empty plates make the most noise. When there's substance in it, it doesn't make much noise. But when it's empty, it's a clanging and a banging that you're everywhere. And in verse 17, 15 to 19, Jesus prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. May I remind us, Christians, believers, we are not of the world, just like Jesus said. We, we often sing this song, this world is not my home. I'm passing through. But the way some of us are speaking, you would think that we are making sure we put down roots here so that we'll be here forever. But Jesus is praying. He said, they are not of the world. Then he says, sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me in the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. You may have heard references to sanctifying them by the truth many times this morning. That was deliberate. Jesus had told the disciples in earlier teachings that they would do the works he did and even greater works which means taking the gospel beyond their immediate geography to the farthest reaches of the world because he was going to the Father. Obviously, the disciples weren't going to do great church miracles in, you know, for example, raising the dead. Jesus did that, healing the sick. They weren't doing greater than those, but the whole idea here is that Jesus ministered in that particular geographical area. And he's saying to them, when I'm gone, I go to the Father, you're going to have the Spirit, you are going to be all over the world. So in terms of sheer volume of what was going to be done, it's going to be greater 
because the spirit was going to be with them and they were going to be scattered. And we know that. History tells us that in 35 years, the, the known world was evangelized. So Jesus knew that they would be in the world. So it is obvious that they would remain in the world to carry on his mission. That's why he prayed, I do not ask you to take them out of this the world at that time. We know that he said he's going to come later on to receive them. But for the time being, they had to remain because the work had to be done. So it's obvious that he wasn't going to take them out, that they were going to remain to carry out his mission. He also knew that the evil one, which is Satan, the accuser of the brethren, would oppose them. So he prayed that the father would keep them from falling into his traps. He said, they are not of the world. And Paul reminds us that our citizenship is not of this world. He says in Philippians 3, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul was doing here, he was warning us to observe and follow godly examples. If you read in Philippians chapter 3, that's what he was doing. And notice um, Paul, what he's saying. He said, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross. Folks, Paul was not talking about the unsaved world here. Because he said, there are many who walk. Whenever we see the word walk and the reference, it's talking about those who are presenting themselves as living for Christ. But he said, so many walk, but they're actually enemies of the cross. You mean that even within the body of Christ, there are enemies of the cross? Absolutely. The, the apostles faced unto Christ back then and some of them were in the church in fact uh, part of paul departing speeches to the ephesians he said to them i know that after my departure grievous wolves will enter into the church and that they will cause many to be deceived but they are enemies of the cross paul is saying whose end in verse 19 of philippians 3 whose end is destruction. So we, we sometimes you're, we're appalled at the way we see some believers behaving, even now. But Paul said their end is destruction. Whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame? Who set their mind on earthly things? This is not a reference to unbelievers. This is a reference to some who profess Christ. Paul says their whole intention is fleshly, earthly things. Jesus said at one time, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and thieves don't break in and steal. And then he goes on to say, for what does it profit a man though he gain the whole world and lose his soul? But there are many in the way today who are profiting for down here. And that's why earlier on I said some are acting as if they are going to be down here forever. So they're making sure they put down roots and establish some kind of a dynasty that they can use later on. But those things, you know, the Lord says, uh, Paul said, that everything we do will be tested by fire. And if it's made of wood, hay, or stubble, it will burn. But if it's gold or silver, it will be preserved. It will be purified. To be sanctified, because Jesus says, sanctify them through that truth. To be sanctified means to be cleansed 
and made holy in preparation to do the will of God. So the question is, what does the sanctifying? And the clear answer is, the word of God is what does the sanctifying. He said, sanctify them by thy truth. Some versions said, through thy truth. So the sanctifying or the cleansing is through the word of God. It's believing the word of God, having already been saved once we accept Jesus Christ as our savior. So it's believing the word of God and daily obeying the word of God that sanctifies the believer, which is why it is so incredibly important that we stay in the word of God. It's like staying under the wash, staying in the wash where the, the, the daily scrubbing and the cleansing and the cleaning can happen. So therefore, if we are not getting the word, if we are not staying in the word, if the word is not being, not going forward to people, what's doing the washing? We are told in the scripture that it said, where there is no vision, the people perish. In the Old Testament, it is spoken of in Samuel and in other parts of the scripture, in the book of Judges, that the word of God was scarce. That means it was not readily available because the priests at that time were failing in their duty because they were corrupt. And one example I can give to you, we know about Eli. If you are a Bible reader, you know about Eli, who was the head priest, and his two sons, who were priests, but they were totally corrupt. And if you read what was happening, you will see how oh, displeased God was with them because the word of God was scarce. And when Samuel was called, one of the description was the word of God was scarce in those days. And yet there were priests. Corruption was everywhere in the priesthood. No washing was happening. And when the word of God is scarce, you know what happened? Everyone does what is right in their own sight. Everybody just do what they want because there is no washing. There's nothing that holds us to an answer that holds us to a responsibility. It should therefore come as no surprise that the enemy would want to distract us from giving diligent attention to the word of God and follow fables instead. The scripture says, that many want, Isaiah wrote about it, that many would say, don't teach to me truth. Teach to me things that I want to hear. And the scripture said, some have accumulated to themselves, teachers, because they have itching ears. Tell me something that will make me feel good. Don't tell me what I need to hear. It's the truth that we need to hear. And folks, sometimes the truth is very hard because the truth is pure. The truth is not biased. The truth doesn't pick sides. The truth exposes. It was the word, the truth that Jesus himself used to blunt Satan's attempt in the wilderness. It was the truth he used. Because when Satan came to Jesus, he said to Satan, it is written. People are chasing around today looking for a word. And God has given his word. That's why people are so confused today. There are so many voices saying so many things and yet the word of God is speaking but if we are not listening if we are not tuned to it if we tune it out and listen to the noise we become confused we become distracted exactly what Satan wants to do the weapon that Jesus used was the word at every step that's what Jesus did. 
even though he is God in the flesh, he's the one who gave the word because the Bible said he's the word. But even when he was on earth, if you notice Jesus' pattern, he always goes back to the written word. Why did he do that? Because you want to leave us an example that this is what you need to use. Because there will be all kinds of voices that will come at you. Sustain the word. The word of God is truth. In, in Hebrews we read, For the word of God is living and powerful. The King James says it's quick. The word quick means it's living and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. These speak deep into our being. The word of God will make people mad if they are not in agreement with it. It will even make Christians mad who don't believe the word of God. And I have at least one example I want to show to you this morning. Stephen, the first martyr, stood up and he spoke the word. The reaction to that but when they heard him, they grit their teeth, they ripped their clothes, and they rushed at him, and they stoned him. You know why? Because the word of God is like a two-edged sword, and it pierces through the mind, the heart, the intents, the intentions. That means whatever we are thinking, whether it's good or evil, the word of God knows it. And it gets to that place where it will basically stand us up and say, that is wrong. And we can either reject it or we can humble ourselves and plunge ourselves under the washing of the word. That's the point I want us to get this morning, that it is the cleansing power that we have. Paul actually said in Ephesians 5, in verse 27, that Jesus is going to present the church to him, to himself, without spot or wrinkle. But if you read in verse 26 and 27 of Ephesians, how is he going to present it? It says, by the washing of water, by the word. The church today, its cleansing is through adhering to the word of God. Nice stories are nice stories. The word of God is the word of God. We don't have an option. We don't have anything else. In Psalm 1, 1989, I'm coming to an end. God's word is revealed. He said, thy word is forever settled in heaven. Folks, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. God has not provided another cleansing force. He's provided his word. That's why Jesus stayed in the word. And the scripture said he sanctified himself. And if you notice, he always referred to his word. He said, I always do those things that pleases my father. The alternative, and this is my last point to you this morning. The alternative to following the word of God is to be blown by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in their cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. I repeat that. The alternative to following the word of God is to be blown by every wind of doctrine that means everybody has a word here, somebody has a word there. 
and people are following, running from east to west, north to south, following the word and get confused and I don't know what to do. But the alternative to the word of God is to be blown by every doctrine, by the trickery of men. Folks, there are people who are out for themselves and you just don't know it. That's the trickery of men in their cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Instead, we must speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.14 is what I just quoted from. Let us not be blown about because we will only come to the stature of the fullness of Christ, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 again, through the word. That's why he gave ministry to the church, that the church may be edified, built up in Christ, till we come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Did you notice that? That's how we are coming to be what Christ wants us to be, through his word. We don't have anything else. Anybody else who's giving you something else than the word of God, they're feeding you poison food. Listen to the word of God. I don't have anything else to tell you but the word of God. I will not give anything else but the word of God. I may have opinion about stuff, whether it be economics or politics or you name it. But it's the word of God that the body of Christ needs. Nothing else. And it is sad to see that so many times that's not what's happening. So folks, can I encourage you this morning? Can I challenge you this morning to get your nose into the word of God? Read the word of God. Study the word of God. When you hear something you're not sure of, say, Lord, I'm not sure of that. Please guide me through your word. The spirit of truth, Jesus told his disciples, will guide you into all truth. He is the guide. When I don't understand stuff, you know what I do? I don't go around and get confused. I say, Lord, you will show that to me. Just wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. May the Lord bless you this morning. May his peace abide with you. And may you take this to heart. Well, I hope you were blessed this morning. I know I was. And the great thing about meeting with God is that you're always blessed. He's always speaking. He's always loving. He's always touching. I pray that this week, the word that was given to you would just take up root, that that seed or those seeds would just really dig down deep into the soil of your heart. And that as the word continues to provide nourishment and fertilization to that seed, that it would grow and that fruit would begin to develop. You know, the word is always for our growth and our development. And God is the kind of God that is a loving father. And he never does anything to shame us. And he will, by his Holy Spirit, convict us, but it's to growth for better. So this week, I hope that all will be well with you and that you will continue to see God moving throughout your life. God bless.